jumping in this morning. Just want to jump straight in, honestly, to what is now, I believe, week eight. doesn't really matter, but I'm pretty sure it's week eight in our how-to series. So that's a long series for us. We've taken the last couple of months, and really we've done a lot of kind of once-off words, uh, but they all fit within this framework. We felt like we had a discipleship assignment from God to take certain topics that maybe themselves wouldn't be an entire series and just kind of unpack what it looks like to lean into what God makes possible for us. Whether we were talking about last week being family or a few weeks ago studying the Bible, which was what Christy shared on the other side. But, you know, whatever it is that we've been sharing in this series, we are just trying to understand God's heart for us in it. So just... Today, I'm going to take another run at it. Then next week, we will have one last word in the how-to series, and I'm not giving that away, but you don't want to miss it. The week after that, May the 5th, everybody, Cinco de Mayo, but that's not really what I'm trying to shout out. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it, though. Hallelujah. But um, we will have Paul and Marinette Van Collar in the house with us from Hope Family Church in George, South Africa. Yeah, those of you who know are clapping because you know us. It's going to be awesome. And they'll be with us all three services. And we're making that a special invite Sunday. Bring a friend to church on that Sunday. We'll do some special things uh, and just enjoy that time together. But let's fill the house. I know that's going to be a powerfully impactful Sunday. So plan on being here for May the 5th. But today I want to take us into a message just simply titled, How to Share the Gospel. Ah! <laughs> That's often the reaction you get from people like, oh, oh yikes, right? Like, and, and there are certain words that, you know, they just almost cause people's uh, sort of anxiety to go up like evangelism. You're a Christian, you're supposed to be evangelizing. You know, people get nervous about those words. Can I uh, take that off of you right now and say that this is who we are called to be in a supernaturally natural way, so just relax a little bit, breathe a little bit. We're called to share. We're called to share the gospel, but let me just start with that in this introduction. We're called to share. Come on. I don't know how you grew up. I don't know if you grow, grew up learning to share or not. Man, I'm the youngest of five, everybody. Maybe you were an only child, any only child's in the house, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so you're the first, the middle, and the last. Help us, Lord. Well, I hope you share, you know. Y'all teach her. I know you are. She got good parents. She's doing all right. But, you know, I didn't have a choice but to share. I'm the youngest. Did you hear me say that? They was going to take my stuff anyway. So I might as well just share, right? And that's not completely true because, candidly, I had a, a really good mom in terms of parenting skill. Dad was I, right, but mom leaned into Jesus and was really intentional. And I ain't trying to throw my dad under the bus. I'm just trying to be honest with you. Dad was on a journey to Jesus that took most of his life. So he wasn't really great without mom, but man, she would sort you out. Anybody have a parent in your life that would line your brakes? That was my mama. Okay. We were going to share. And they didn't take any of my stuff because that wouldn't have worked out. If they had taken my stuff, their stuff would have been my stuff. I mean, we, I'm telling you the truth, man. With my hand up, we were taught to share. And it is God's heart that we would as well. Whatever we have. When we think about sharing, I think we sort of default to possessions. And there's some truth in that. But the gospel, we are called to share the good news of who Jesus is. And I'm going to come back and define that a little bit more clearly in just a moment. But just to harp on the sharing point for a minute, Jesus himself said in Luke 6, 37, he said, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, which means they pressed it down and then shook it so more could fit in there, right? Shaken together and then running over will be put in your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Now, traditionally, when we look at this passage, we are thinking physical possessions. But actually, in context, uh, and, and it applies to that. I don't think that's a misapplication, but it's not the most appropriate application because this passage comes in the Sermon on the Mount, which was a specific teaching, really the first time that Jesus just prepared a big message to share, and he packed a ton of truth in it. Truth about who he was, why he came, and how that should impact how we live. And the verses that precede this passage, precede this passage are verses that say, look, don't be putting judgments on people or condemning people. Forgive and it will be forgiven you, right? Give, that's where he goes, and it will be given unto you. He was talking about the gospel, everybody. 
He was talking about all those things that we need in this life to overcome our sin nature and to live as healthy, whole humans in relationship with God and each other. Give and you will receive. Right? And you need some mercy? Give some mercy. You know what I'm saying? Like, share. That was pretty good. Y'all are really quiet, man. I'm telling you. Help me out, online crowd. I hear you over there. Right? Share. share. Matter of fact, the, the biblical approach to having plenty is to intentionally share what you have. Because you may be thinking, I don't have very much. Share what you have. I mean, that's what generosity looks like. And we preached a word on that in this series too, how to live generously, right? But it, it, it isn't just giving out of your abundance. It's giving out of your lack. That's what it means to be generous and to give a generous portion. Give more than you got, right? You'll never be able to outgive God or give more than he's given. The gospel is the truth about Jesus, how he loves, forgives, redeems, and restores. And again, we saw those testimonies on Friday night in Hope Life. Man, that was the gospel. Those guys were sharing their testimony about how Jesus, the God of the gospel, had impacted their lives. It was the gospel truth too, man. They didn't make anything up. It was legit and real. We're called to share the gospel. How do we do that though? So I'm not here this morning to teach you how to witness, though I'll touch on some points that may help us a bit along the way, but I want to talk about how to share the gospel, number one, Recognize the call. Yeah, that's a repeat from last week's first point. Last week when we talked about how to be family, we started with recognize the call. you got to recognize your call. If you're going to marry somebody, you better hear from God that that's the person you're called to marry. And you need to recognize that, right? And in this case and in this context, as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, we need to recognize that our Father, is a, He's got something that He's working on, right? And that's to seek and save the lost. And we are meant to be about the Father's business. That is why we are here, to know Him and make Him known. We're all called. You say, well, hold up now. That's not really how I see this. I mean, it doesn't matter how I see it or how you see it. It matters how the Word says it. Okay. Well, you say, well, no, that's what we pay you for. Okay. Mm. Mm. I had so many thoughts right then. I'm so proud of myself. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Right? But we say, no, that's the work of hired hands. Professional clergy are called to share the gospel. What? Where? Chapter and verse. Show me chapter and verse. Show me. My gracious, the first two letters in the word gospel are go. I know that's impressive, right? That's like doing math. I feel real smart right now. Go. And the go passage in the word, like Mark 16, go into the whole world and proclaim the what? Gospel to the whole creation. Who was he talking to? Everybody. Everybody. That's who? The Great Commission, when Jesus was ascending, right, to heaven that he gave to us in Matthew 28. Go. And I'll be with you. I'm not going to leave you on your own. Go make disciples of all nations. Recognize the call right out there, right out there. The nation's right outside our door and over the ocean and anywhere else God calls us to go. Sets us up with an assignment. Y'all landed in a passion point for pastor this morning. I'm going to tell you, we preaching about sharing the gospel. My gracious, we are called, y'all. Yes, you. William Booth. The founder of the Salvation Army said, not called, you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go. <clears throat> we kids of the king are called to introduce people to Jesus and the life we found, found in him. We all are. We all are. And we do that in a variety of ways. I'll come to that in a minute. Matter of fact, Luke 14 uh, Jesus was, again, just after the go, uh, and well, this is the go passage from Luke 14, I should say, but just before he said to go in Luke 14, he was telling a story, a metaphor of a man who was inviting people to an amazing feast. And he put the word out to all the people that you would expect would want to come, and they had a bunch of excuses. Well, I just bought a field, or one guy said, I got a new wife. That's my favorite lame excuse ever. Right there. And, 
I preach a whole message on that. I don't have time to today, but there's a lot in that. That meant a lot. That was offensive at a level that on just a simple reading you won't uh, understand, but it was an offensive way to respond to this man. And then he said, well, go get the, those that others wouldn't want to invite. And the master of the feast had done that, and there's still space. He said, well, then go. This passage, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. This is our call. Compel them to come in that my house might be full. Oh, Ron, you just want to grow the church. I want to grow the kingdom. I want to obey God's word. I want to live into that. I don't want to settle for what we can do. I want to see what God can do. And I want to see the lost found and the found free and following. And I don't want to spend my life on anything else but that. And neither candidly should you. No matter what your vocation or job is, we're all called. This is what we're called to. Okay. Y'all still love me, right? <laughs> Secondly, how to share the gospel. Be ready to share. You got to be ready to share. You know, like for one thing, you can't consume it all and have anything left to share. Now, in regards to the gospel, you really can't consume it all because you're not, you're, you're not a container. You're a conduit. Okay, grace and mercy only really work in your life when they flow. When they flow, you, you try to shut it down, not forgive someone else. You won't, you won't walk in forgiveness. That's the word, everybody. Again, we're called to be conduits, not containers. But we, need, we still need to be ready to share. We have to be intentional about that. Now, you can apply this to speaking. I remember one of the Sundays when Karen, she had been coming to my home church. We were dating and uh, she hadn't been there a lot of times, but I believe it, it had been a few times. But I was singing on the stage during worship. Scary, I know. And so I'm getting ready to come down. My granddad was the pastor of the church that I grew up in. So he's coming up and I'm coming down. And he grabs me. Granddad, a big man, like 6'4", 340, something like that. So I'm walking off the stage and he grabs me and whispers in my ear as he's turning me. And he says, I believe you've got the word this morning. <laughs> well, okay. I don't remember what I preached. <laughs> I'm not too sure it was great. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But that's not the kind of uh, ready to share I'm talking about. I'm not going to just hand you a mic, so get over that idea. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Although there are people in this house, I'll say, hey, I think you're supposed to land this, or I think you're supposed to close out in prayer. I've certainly done that to Christy. I've done that to Miles. I've done that to many of you, uh, right? But, but ready to share in this context, again, ready to share the gospel. Like the good news about who Jesus is. I got amazing people who consistently live in front of folks that won't close my life group in prayer. I'm okay with that. But if God divinely appoints you to love someone into relationship with them, don't miss that. All right, I'm not going to make you publicly pray, but you need to be ready to rep the heart of God and to share. Don't hold back and don't hoard the goodness of God, my gracious. Worship Christ as Lord of your life, that's where it starts. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. And often our lives are the best explanation, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. We're called to be, somebody say ready. ready. Stay ready to share and you won't have to be scheduled to share. Some folk never, they don't testify unless they're asked to testify. Testify everybody, there I asked you. I'm asking everybody to testify all week long outside the doors of this church. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And don't just say it with your words. Say it with your actions. With your life. Be ready to share. Get yourself ready. Well, I'm not ready. Well, get ready. You finna go on a trip or something? Nate, who again is preaching at South, he said, you know, it made me think of you, Ron. He said, because you, you know, you always talk about putting gas in the tank, checking them tires, because we finna drive it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like to punch it when it's time to go. And just, just get your heart ready with the Lord because we are scheduled. You say, well, you, if, you, if you will... Uh, be ready to share. You won't have to be scheduled to share. But what really is true is that you are scheduled tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and the day. You're always on the schedule. 
God's constantly making divine appointments. We live and act and interact in this world in spaces where our lives tell his story. The truth about who Jesus is is you. The grace and mercy he's shown to you and to me. Or God's bad at math or don't care about people. Because either we miss a lot of divine appointments, and I say that consistently around here, or God is bad at math or doesn't care about people. God's not bad at math. I'm going to break this down for you, man. The universe was built on the most incredible computations you could ever imagine, and he just made it happen, all right? From the smallest uh, cell to the most amazing bit of our universe and beyond, the great mathematician miraculously created all of it. That's all I have time to say about that. And he does care about people enough to invade our space to give himself for us. So the only other option is we're missing some appointments. We're missing some opportunities to rep his heart in our world, be ready to share. And you got to know him to show him again. Worship Christ as Lord in your life. That's 1 Peter 3, 15. That verse starts with that. And then when someone asks, so if you're leaning into Jesus, know him, honor him, and then make him known. All right, everybody? You can't know Jesus in the way you're meant to know him and not make him known. The third way to share the gospel is to reflect the gospel. We're called to be a reflection of this truth. So it isn't even, again... When we're ready, right, it isn't just what we might say, but it is also who we are and how we live, all right? So that's true. I mean, it, we are meant to be a reflection of the God who loves us. More than what we say or how we act, it's how we love and how we live. We are called to be Jesus with skin on in this world. That's how we share the gospel. Are you hearing me? I'm telling you how to go share the gospel. Go be godly. Rep his heart. Reflect his image. Man, and we're not always a very good reflection. As they say, people won't really care what you tell until they can tell you care. Right? You've heard that? Man, when I was a kid, now again, I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up in a really small community and in a small school. And as I've said before, we didn't have a lot, my house, but we did do something at school called show and tell. Anybody? Did you see that? Show and tell. It's not show or tell. It was show and tell. And I rarely ever had anything that I thought anyone would want to see. I just didn't have a lot of stuff, possessions, or anything. And I didn't come up in a very crafty home. I love you, Mom, with Jesus. But it is not our thing. I remember, the only thing I ever actually remember, I was telling Karen this last night, I remember taking a puppy to show and tell. <laughs> Turns out everybody knew what a dog looked like. But <laughs> they still thought my puppy was cute, you know. We had lots of puppies. But there were often things that showed up I had never seen before. I'd only heard about them, but I hadn't seen them. Are y'all following me? Man, I want to be a revelation of God's goodness. If a picture's worth a thousand words, then what is a living human being? I have this conviction. Everyone should get to have a real relationship with a true God follower at least once in their lifetime. A real relationship with a true God follower. Not just hear the gospel, but see it. See it. And I believe that's what God wills for us. There was a man, John 1, verse 6, sent from God, whose name was John. Well, you can change that from man to woman if you need to, and then you can insert your name there, whose name was. That's you, whoever you are. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. Now, I know John had a specific and certain assignment as a forerunner for Jesus, but I believe without... Uh, any doubt because of the counsel of the rest of God's word that we too are called to be like John. We're meant to be a reflection that all might believe through him. Because here's the critical point in this passage to me. He was not the light. Nobody said he was the light. You said, well, I'm just not, I'm not good enough to rep God or the gospel. Uh, neither is anybody else. He was not the light. He was sent to bear witness. Right? And it doesn't even say tell says bear, like he was to rep Jesus before even Jesus got there. And we're meant to rep and reflect Jesus too. Now, you got to be seeing him to reflect him. 
All right, but then also consider this. You know, like, well, I've already looked at the lunar calendar for when we're going to be in the bush with our team going to Southern Africa this summer. And I'm excited. I, we didn't have the ability to negotiate the terms to this degree, but we do land up there when there's a new moon, which means we're going to see stars like you cannot imagine in Western Zambia. There's no artificial light or electricity uh, in many of those places. And... But what really fascinates me is when the moon is big. Like if you're there and you see a full moon in the bush, it's like, it's like an eclipse, but it feels like daylight, like a dim day, but it's still, the light is incredible. The amount of light that the moon produces is unbelievable. It's so bright, even here, for those that love to see the full moon. It's unbelievable how much brighter it makes things. And you know, they say that the moon reflects 7% of the sun's energy. I mean, it's just a big old rock, everybody. Don't make this about you. Make this about the sun. 7%, I think we can beat that. I feel, I mean, I ain't hitting 100, but I'm going to be more reflective. Come on now, I'm going to be more reflective than that. How to share the gospel. Sorry if I hurt your ear just then. How, how to share the gospel. Reflect the gospel. Reflect Jesus, the God of the gospel. And then number four, use your words. You ever get frustrated with a little one? They're trying to communicate something. That's great. I mean, it's great. But eventually, they're like, hey, use your words. <laughs> Listen, the lost world needs us to be brave enough to use our words too. I mean, intentionally crafted with the Holy Spirit, graciously communicated words. Sometimes it's a conversation with someone that I'm in, and I'm like, man, I, I mean... <sighs> I'm, I wish I could fix this. I wish I could heal it or change it. But you need Jesus. There's nobody that can work inside of you but him. You need Jesus. There's a place to say that. Now build, you know, build a bridge. I did a teaching years ago called Eyewitness, and I talk about how to lean in intentionally to uh, really going deep in someone's heart with God. And I always say this, the best place to start with any god size project is prayer. It was called the five eyes, the eyewitness. And the first eye is I pray. Pray with people or for people. Pray for people. Make a to-do list with people's names on it. Think of some people in your life and world in your sphere of influence or connectivity that you should be praying for. And watch what God does. I dare you. Put a little faith on that. And pray for lost people in general and watch God divinely appoint you because when you pray, you see. The second eye is I see. I start to see. I start to notice things. There's a prophetic edge to our witness when we pray. And when you see, then ask Holy Spirit to help you understand how to connect because often we see someone's lostness or brokenness and we know we're not perfect, but we're at least over here on track with God and it's like they're in a parallel universe. There is a gap between them and God, and the devil did it, and Jesus came to solve it. Come on now. And so, but we're here we are sometimes in Christianity. Hey, you, you should get over here. You need to be over here. And they can't make that jump. They're not able to get across the chasm. Build a bridge. The fourth eye is, or the third eye is I connect. I pray, I see, I connect. Build a bridge of relationship and conversation. Take your time, be intentional. And then when we pray and we see and we connect, there will come a point when there's something to say and we need to say it. Use your words. Don't be loud and obnoxious or pushy. Be intentional and let the Lord help you to be persuasive with your story. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, the prophet wrote, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary from holding in, in indeed I cannot. I couldn't hold it in if I wanted to. I'm sitting there, and I'm hearing someone's pain, someone's problem. I don't know what else to do but talk about Jesus, y'all. It doesn't matter if it's at the checkout queue or over a coffee with someone I have long relationship with, and, and I'm careful. I'm intentional. I'm kind. Right? But I'm about to say something. Be, be ready to share and then be willing to use your words. And you're just sitting there and saying, well, that's not me, man. I don't, I don't have no fire shut up in my bones. 
All right, we'll pray. Again, I'll say pray. If you pray, God will work on that. I promise. Fan into flame the gift of God that's inside of you. And the gift that is inside of you is the gospel. And then don't worry about fancy words. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. This is the Apostle Paul even who said this. Keep it simple. That all might believe... I'm sorry... I jumped to a different... When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Here we go. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Hashtag the gospel. In the end of it, nothing is more meaningful than sharing how your relationship with Jesus has impacted your life. Man, I grew up in a church that did testimony time. And I didn't hear people talking about somebody else's story. You know, and I tell stories from other people's experiences for sure, but I'm saying I got a story. Here at 828, we named the church 828 Church because we believe that when someone says, why is the church named 828? Well, it's named that. Yeah, apparently I can't take my watch off. <laughs> That's not why it's named that. That's an unrelated comment. <laughs> It's named that because we believe everybody has a redemption story. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his glory. And when they ask you, we want you to say, yeah, it's 8 to 8 because it comes from Romans 8 to 8. Which, you know, it's, we know that it's not all good, but God's at work in it, all of it for our good. And then you say, actually, in my own life, this was a place where God worked his redemption. It's your story that needs to be told, but it needs to be a firsthand story. Don't, I, listen, I got a story. I share it every month at our Welcome to Church dinner about how that passage became so important to me and a redemptive thing that God did in my life. And I don't, I'm not saying you can never share that story, but I'm saying share your story. We are called to be eyewitnesses. First-hand account. And it don't have to be this big fast. I don't have one of those incredible testimonies of some of these other guys who were even in Hope Life or some of the ladies in Tides. Thank God that God will redeem that and use it. That's not how my story tells. But we all have a story to tell. And they all matter a lot. Hearsay evidence is ineffective and inadmissible. There's a, I took my watch off on purpose because there's an analogy I use. CJ's going to join me on stage. And in this skit, CJ is a, he is a watchmaker. And he's, uh, I don't know if you heard about him, just stand right about over there. And CJ is awesome, by the way, but unrelated to the story. <laughs> but in my story, so don't come up to CJ after church. He doesn't really fix watches. Okay, now <laughs> going back into my story. So uh, I was meeting this person for uh, coffee and they were late. I was a little annoyed but they were telling me that their watch was broken. So I said, you know, I, got, I heard about a guy just right down the street. He's a watchmaker, he's got a cool little shop and he is amazing at fixing watches. Let's get your watch fixed. So we're walking down there. And yeah, you should definitely take your watch to him. He is just fantastic at fixing watches. And actually, I've been meaning to take my watch to him. My watch is also broken and I hate being late. I hate it so much, but he's great at fixing watches. You should definitely let him fix your watch. I'm telling you, this dude can fix watches. Oh, hey man, my friend here has a broken watch and I was just telling him what an amazing watchmaker you are because you, you fix watches and everything. My watch, though, uh, actually my watch, I've been wanting to get my watch fixed. My watch is broken um, and I want you to fix it. And I don't understand really, I mean, why my watch is still broken. It's uh, a good watch, but I, you know, it's, uh, don't tell, I broke it. But he fixes watches. He's really great at it. You should take your watch to him because this guy can fix a watch. And so, but my watch is actually still broken, which is a little frustrating. And I don't know why that's the case. And I'm late for meetings too, because my watch is broken. Why won't you fix my watch? I mean, there's some people in this house today and even give a watch to Jesus. That's real. <clears throat> you may go. But the story we may, need to tell is your watch is broken? Man, check this out. My watch was busted. One of the hands fell off. It wasn't broke. It was broke. And I took it down here to this guy and now I have a brand new watch. I'm not late anymore. Come on, I'll take you down there to him. He's my friend. He's going to give you a deal. <laughs> I 
Testify. Come on, somebody, testify. Carissa's going to join me on the stage, and I'm going to see if I can land this. Paul wrote in Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes to the Jew and also the Gentile. Story time with Ron uh, years ago, also a classic retail, but I was at a, I got asked to speak at a little girl conference. So it was like um, they do this thing called missionettes, and it's sort of a church version of um, Girl Scouts. I got this. And I was like, really? And they actually asked me to come and teach the eyewitness teaching. So I morphed it for uh, middle school, elementary school girls. And I taught about witness. And I said, look, you don't have to, you know, know everything about the Bible. You just have to tell them about what you know about Jesus and how Jesus loves you. And I'm just sharing that and trying to land it. And this little girl just keeps putting her arm up. She was adorable, adorable little one. And finally I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, so are you telling me that I can start talking about Jesus today? And I said, yes, please. And thank you. Through tears, you know what I'm saying? And I'm saying that to you too. Finally, how to share the gospel? Together. Together. Listen, that point keeps showing up in this how-to series as well, because every destiny and dream of God works better together. None of us tell a complete version of this story. Every one of us have seen and experienced God. It all lines up with the word, but it's not the same. And, and we have different giftings, different callings, different spheres of influence. We can't build a church alone. We need to do that together. And if you'll bring them here, I'll tell them about Jesus. I promise I will help. We're not limited to that, but this is a pretty good strategy that the Lord came up with for us. Hallelujah. How do we share the gospel? Together. It's how the New Testament church was birthed in Acts chapter 2. Together. Here at 828, we have a culture of invitation. We want to be invitational. We want people not just to feel valued, but to, come on now, be valued. Get our hearts right and keep them right. We value people. We love people the way Jesus loved people. And that's hard. It's hard for you sometimes to love me. Stay with it. Don't give up. Hallelujah. The Lord will help you. Do you hear me? It's a culture of invitation. We ain't closing the doors. We will figure out a way when we fill up three to do something else. Because we're not going to say no to reaching people. We can do that together. And we better do it together with the Holy Spirit. We can't do any of this on our own. We in and of ourselves are not enough. It was Oswald Smith who said, any church that isn't seriously involved in helping fulfill the Great Commission has forfeited its biblical right to exist. This is what we are called to do. If you don't like it, find a different church. I ain't trying to be harsh. I'm just saying, I don't want you to sit here and be frustrated. We're gonna work hard to see the lost found and the found free and following. And following means we're gonna share the gospel. We're going to talk about Jesus a lot. We're not going to fudge on what his word says. The poem this week is the gospel truth, the most powerful truth, and it's not even close. Jesus gave himself to save us. He refused to let us go. And he didn't barely save us. He conquered death and set us free with grace and mercy in abundance. For anyone close, it's plain to see. A miracle has happened here, and I should know. I'm living proof. Sin debt paid, life restored. That's the gospel truth. That's Jesus, everybody. That's what Jesus did. And we, we need to understand Matthew 5, 14 was written to a crowd, not one person. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. We shine brighter when we shine together. Together. The Great Commission our reach the whole world command from our King is virtually impossible without partnership. But we have partnership. And our call 
just like the Son of Man, to seek and save those who are lost. Come on, worship team. Help us, Lord. Somebody give it up for Jesus real quick. I love the gospel. One last story. Uh, I have long followed uh, uh, the revivalist from the mid-1800s, D.L. Moody, a few of his autobiographies and such. And he tells a story about a, a man that lived in the hill country uh, a couple of centuries ago. And this man lived in a little cobblestone hut just off the road and he loved Jesus big. And in front of his cobblestone house near to the road was a stream that had a spring. So even when the stream would be virtually dry, there was fresh water coming out of the spring and people would stop along the way. And, and there was one man that was a, a famous evangelist that would stop and get water and got to the place where he made him a little room in his house and he would stay with him. And he just envied him so much because he said, you do such amazing things for God. You're gonna to get to heaven one day and have such an amazing crown to give to the Christ because of all the work for him you've done. And I wish I could, but he wasn't physically able to travel and, and that sort of thing. And the evangelist just told him, he said, look, people stop for water at your stream all the time. Even serving them is a way that you love others for God. And, but he took it a step further. He thought, well, I'm gonna, that's a good point. I'm gonna take who I am and use it for Jesus. And so he literally hired some guys to move his cobblestone hut closer to the road. And he built a little well around the stream and dug down a bit deeper and put a bucket in a ladle, free water, free fresh water for travelers. And they built a little seating area out of stone around it. And during the day, he would just sit under the shade and welcome travelers, talk to them about Jesus or whatever the topic of the day became, but always repping the heart of God. And, and then sometime later, the evangelist came passing through the area and he went to see the man he was gonna stay there and realized the man was deathly ill. He kind of got the word out to the community and as soon as the word hit, man, people started coming. I mean, it was like just before dusk and crowds of people started shuffling through to see this man. He passed away and then all through the night and into the next dawn, the house was constant with dozens and dozens, even hundreds of people who passed through to pay their respect to the little well keeper. The evangelist was amazed. And then he said that after that had settled, he fell asleep. Had been up all night, fell asleep and he had a dream. And in his dream, the little man was walking up to the gate of heaven. And as he came in, he was apologizing to Jesus. I'm sorry, I don't have a crown. I don't have any jewels for a crown. I wanna give you a crown. And Jesus said, no jewels. And he looked at his cloak and his clothes and they were just covered with gems, priceless gems. And Jesus started to pull them and take them and make for him a crown. Where did these come from, Lord? From every conversation and kindness and the tears of those passerbys in the night. Come on now. Well done, good and faithful. Here's a crown for you to lay down. The response to this word is outside that door, church family. We grew up singing, I surrender all in my church. It's a different version that we're about to sing now. And I think it's punchier. <laughs> With all that I am, every breath in my lung every moment, consider it yours. Can we say that this morning? Can we do that with God today? Can we decide that we are called and capable of sharing the gospel together? In Jesus' name. <laughs>